But today um, is one of my favorite peoples here today. I had an opportunity a few years ago to meet Jim Purr. Apparently he, he was going to the, the church in Kit Carson for years after years after years, and we supported him for years. And I remember a number of years ago, or a few years ago, I went and had coffee with him at Starbucks because I was flying out to speak somewhere and just got to meet and hear his heart. And his heart is right in line with Scripture. But what I like about it too, can you get the lights, please? The, is, um, his heart is right in line with Scripture, but it's also right in line with the vision that God has given our church, which is to go make disciples of all nations. And, and a lot of people think of mission fields like you don't really hit a mission field until you hit, you know, Mexico or the tribes of Africa or anything like this, but he's in Europe. And, um, and, and it's amazing to me when I went and met with him over in Europe is that less than, eight, you know, less than 1% of most of those countries in Europe are Christian. Actually, I was talking to Pastor Zibi in Poland where we started Bible school. He said less than half percent of Poland is Christian. And so how many of you guys know that's a mission field to show the love of God. And so he's been planting churches over there and we've been supporting him. And uh, what I like about him, I'm going to say this because this is very important that you understand about the mindset of the guy getting ready to come up here. Is I had dinner with him last night in, in Lyman and we're talking and we've known each other for a few years now. And then he says, you know, Scott, he goes, I'm not blowing smoke here, but you're one of the most unique pastors I've ever met. You know, and that's one of those times where I'm, I'm like, awesome, congratulations, thank you, you know. <laughs> but the reason being is our hearts are in sync with, we would rather be around people lost than people found. And that's the kind of heart that we're supporting when we support Jim Purr, and it's a wonderful thing. The work he's doing incredible is incredible, and after church, we're going to take another offering for him. There's a difference between tithes and offerings, but we just want to love him. I mean, this guy literally flew here. On his, on his own dime, rented a car, and, and just to talk to you guys and share with what is going on. And I was excited to introduce him to the new church of Church Alive. So just um, open up your hearts, get ready, and, and pray about what to give when we're done, okay? I just mean that. And then when you're done, don't just run out of the church. Shake his hand, uh, get to know him a little bit, and you'll be glad, you'll be glad you did. Amen? Amen. So give a hand to Jim Purr. <laughs> Man, well, I'm happy to be here at Cheyenne. First time ever for me to be in Cheyenne Wells. I grew up in Colorado. Amen. How many of you know Colorado is a blessed state? Amen. And uh, my family all lives in the Denver area. I'm going to be with my mom and a lot of my family in Arvada this, this afternoon. And uh, but it's it's great to be back here. But uh, we, everybody get one of these cars. Did anybody not get one? And uh, the reason we pass out these cards is because, uh, first of all, a lot of people don't know where Hungary is. How many of you understand why? <laughs> you know it's over there someplace. And that's probably the way I was about um, 21 years ago. But we've been living there for the last 20 years. And, um, but uh, many of you don't know who Brenda and I are. Uh, my wife and I, we, uh, my wife Brenda, she's in Florida right now uh, with our grandbaby. Everybody say praise the Lord for those that understand that. I asked her, do you want to come to Colorado with me this weekend or stay with our grandbaby? And that took about 10 seconds to figure that out. And so she's with our grandbaby in Orlando with our son and uh, our, one of our, and our daughter-in-law. And, uh, but she sends her greetings. But Brenda and I have been married for 36 years this year. And uh, I always say that, still very much in love. And we love doing what we're doing. And uh, we're very much in love. And I always say it's because uh, I'm so easy to live with. Amen? <laughs> and she says it's because I travel a lot. <laughs> Amen. But um, can I just be myself this morning? Amen. I'll, I find out we are the most effective in God's kingdom when we are who we are. Amen? And a lot of times we try to be super spiritual or try to be like another person. And, uh, but I know those guys that Jesus chose, those, those guys were probably not super spiritual. How many of you understand? I grew up in the Catholic church. Anybody here grew up Catholic? Oh, quite a few of us did. And, uh, but I grew up Catholic, and, and I was an altar boy and did all that. And, uh, yeah, I was, but I was not born again. And uh, I did not have Jesus in my heart. It's not where you go to church, it's who you have in your heart. And you can go to, be, go to my mom and a lot of my family go to Catholic church. They totally love God. And my wife grew up Baptist and, and, and all that kind of thing. But uh, I had this, this idea growing up Catholic of all these saints. You know what I'm talking about? All the statues, all these 12 guys, uh, uh, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Philip, all them. They were saying, but they were just like us. Amen? <laughs> and they changed. 
They change the world. And, uh, but we pass out these cards. Uh, Brenda and I, we've been missionaries for almost 35 years now. And we love doing what we're doing. We're here in the United States for just a few weeks and less than 10, about 10 days. We'll go back to Budapest, Hungary. We've been uh, just enjoying ourselves. we got four children. Our oldest, Nathan and Lori, uh, and his wife, Lori, live in Orlando, and they're doing great. I uh, have another son, Ryan, and his wife, Katie. They live in Nashville, Tennessee, and work for a financial ministry organization, Dave Ramsey. Anybody ever heard of that? Some of you might have. And they're doing really good. And I, We've got a 22-year-old daughter, Alexandra. She she stayed in Budapest this summer, and, uh, and then we have a 19-year-old daughter who uh, was eight months old when we moved to Budapest, Hungary, and just finished her first year of college in Florida, but she lived her whole life there, and, but all of our kids love God, and they've loved living all over the world, and uh, our, we lived six years in Costa Rica when we first went to the mission field in the 80s, and uh, then we lived three years in Moscow in the early 90s when it was just changing over from communism. How many of you remember communism but behind the Iron Curtain? And then for the last 20 years there, we lived in Budapest. But we pass out these cards. Everybody take those cards. How many, because we ask people to pray for us, how many of you know there's a real enemy that doesn't want us in Budapest hungry? Just like there's a real enemy that doesn't want this church in Cheyenne Wells. You don't have to go 7,000 miles to fight battles. I think we all know that. And so we pass out these cards, and there's a magnet on there, and uh, you can put that on your refrigerator, and you can put this card in your Bible, and uh, we hear people praying for us all the time because you're not a missionary for 35 years without people praying for you. And when we say people praying for you, I always say this because I... Uh, not everybody understands. When we believe, we, we say people pray for us, we believe 45 seconds of prayer mixed with faith is powerful. We don't necessarily mean pray 45 minutes. 40, that would be wonderful, Pastor Scott. But, <laughs> but um, uh, 45 seconds of prayer mixed with faith is powerful. You could be standing in the line checking out at Walmart in our names, Jim and Brenda Purr come before you. How many of you know that's not the devil? <laughs> or you're on your way to work or at school and your pastor, Pastor Lori and Scott's names come before you. That's usually the Holy Spirit. And somebody said, well, how do you pray for somebody standing in the line at Walmart? <laughs> well, you step out of line. How many of you know that's a step of faith? <laughs> And you go to a different part of the store and say, God bless Jim and Brenda there in Budapest, Hungary. Lord, you brought them before my, 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 my eyes just now and anoint them, protect them, give them wisdom and uh, just guide them in what they're doing today in Jesus' name. And I'm fine when I'm obedient to those small things, then God begins to show me greater things. How many of you want to hear greater things? And a lot of times we think, well, why can't I stay in the line at Walmart and as soon as I get done finished paying for my groceries, then I'll, I'll do it. Most of the time, you forget about it. So it's the obedience. And so and, and we pass out those cards and uh, then we also, uh, Church Alive supports us, different people in this church support us. And if you feel led to support us, either monthly or in special gifts, uh, there's a few things you don't have to pray about. You don't ever have to pray about whether God wants you to tithe or not. God all wants us all the tithe. And another thing is God us, wants us all to be involved in world missions. And so we have people that support us anywhere from $5 a month on up. And everybody's, if everybody's obedient to what God, the Holy Spirit tells them to do, everybody's needs are going to be met. Amen? Amen. But I believe I have a word for Church Alive and Cheyenne Wells this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, or it's going to be up on the screen, and I'm going to read a scripture that has been uh, really helpful to me, and I, I don't travel to speak at a church and come all the way to Cheyenne Wells just to give another missionary message. I believe every time we get together in Jesus' name, God wants to speak. Whether we're in a women's meeting or a men's meeting or a youth meeting or a Sunday morning, I believe God wants to speak. Your pastor might not know what's going on in your life. I might not know what's going on in your life, but there is somebody here this morning that knows what's going on in your life. And that's the Holy Spirit. And I said, every time God, I believe God wants to speak. Every time we sit under the word. But a lot of times, we got other things on our mind when we come to church. Like, how long is this missionary going to speak? <laughs> 
or uh, um, or where am I going to eat today, or the golf tournament, or the game this afternoon, or the shopping, or whatever it is. But for the next 30 minutes or so, let's just hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. Amen? And so I'm going to read out of, uh, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it. And uh, this is David in the, in the first Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. And David, the king of Israel, and it says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. How many of you would be distressed? Stoning him. And, and David was greatly distressed, for the people st- spoke of stoning him, because of the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and daughters. But David encouraged himself. Everybody say encouraged himself. In the Lord his God. I want to talk about encouraging ourselves. How many of you know that can be discouraging living in this world? If you saw the news just this summer and you're watching what's going on in Orlando or Dallas or, or Nice or Paris or Brussels or Munich or, you know, whatever the last thing has happened. How many of you know it could be discouraged? And but... David was right in the middle of that, right in the middle of different issues, and he encouraged himself. Sometimes you need to encourage yourself. I remember when I first became a Christian, I grew up, I say, I grew up in in, in Boulder, uh, Colorado, Boulder, all my family. I'm one of eight kids. I'm right in the middle. And in the early 70s, um, a lot of people, most people here weren't even born then, but uh, shows how old I am. But... uh, (laughs) And uh, we, two of my brothers and I, we were all druggies. How many of you remember that? <laughs> and uh, you don't if you were a druggie. <laughs> and, uh, but we were all kind of hippies and things like that. And, uh, and uh, I went to church every Sunday, went to Mass on Sunday. And uh, I, um, but somebody invited me when I was a senior in high school. It's in Tyrus High School, right outside of Lafayette near Boulder. And somebody invited me to a church like this. And it was actually a girl named Rita in in my class. And I don't know if she invited 50 people, Pastor Scott, or just invited me. And uh, I went because I liked Rita. (laughs) (laughs) Can I be honest with you? (laughs) And uh, but God knew my heart. And so I went, and I went to a church like this, and I heard a speaker speak in Loveland, and uh, I don't remember anything the person talked about, but I gave my life to the Lord, and it changed my life. And my dad thought I was in a cult, (laughs) and because I would go to church all the time and just consume my life. And I was a senior in high school in 1975, and then I started learning some things about the Word of God, how uh, the Bible is powerful, and God wants to bless us, and uh, we can use our faith and the authority of the believer and the power of our words, and you know how uh, God really wants to bless us. And I remember, I thought... Man, one time, I remember about five years after I was uh, in, uh, uh, born again, I started, came out of some kind of meeting, Christian meeting, and I thought, man, as soon as I learn to get my faith up, as soon as I learn to hear the voice of God, memorize some scripture, I'm not going to have any more problems. <laughs> you know, some kind of financial problem comes along, I'll just speak the word and it'll go away. How many of you don't, don't work that way? <laughs> and I remember... Uh, the very first time I'm talking about encouraging yourself in the Lord. My wife and I, we knew we were going to be missionaries to Latin America back in the early 80s. And uh, we, uh, we knew we were going to be missionaries to somewhere in Latin America. And uh, uh, this was 1982, early 1982. And we realized the first thing we need to do, if we need, we're going to learn to be missionaries. If we're going to be missionaries, we need to learn Spanish. How many of you know, if you're going to go to Latin America, you speak Spanish. <laughs> And everybody had always told us that Spanish is easy to learn. How many of you have heard that? If it's so easy, why don't we all speak it? <laughs> it's easy compared to Korean or Arabic or, or something like that. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, we're in the will of God. And so we decided to go to this language school in Costa Rica, Central America. And this was the, one of the best language schools in the world, the Southern Baptist, the Methodist, the Presbyterian, the Assemblies of God. They send them to this language school in Costa Rica, and they go there for eight months, and then they go to Argentina, in Spain, in Mexico, in Guatemala. And many of them that go to that language school, they come back to the United States as ministers to the Spanish-speaking people because the United States is the third largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. 
And I remember we were going to go there, and we thought, man, once we really found the will of God for our lives, everything was going to be easy. You know, I don't know where we get that idea. We don't get it out of the book of Acts. You know, you know, you just find the will of God. And so we decided we go to mission, go to most San Jose, Costa Rica, and uh, we're in this class. In, Costa Rica is a country in Central America, right between Nicaragua and right in Panama, and about three million people. And we go to this class. There's 300 students in this school, and you go from eight o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock, four hours of Spanish every day. And even though there's 300 students, you're separated into classes of five or six. And from day one, the very first day in January 1982, the teacher, in the first minute, she's talking to us in Spanish. And for the next four hours, she talks to us in Spanish in our little group of six people. She don't even know English. The other students in the class were taking notes. <laughs> I didn't want to act stupid, so I started taking notes too. <laughs> Faith notes. <laughs> and I go out of there, I don't have a clue what just happened. You understand what I'm talking about? We find out we're in the, we really in the will of God. We have this mentality. Get in the will of God. Things will be easy. There'll be grace there. And we've always heard that Spanish is easy to learn. And we're going into class there. The first week goes by. I am so far behind. Don't even have a clue that's going on. The second week goes by. I'm in this class uh, with, six other, with six students. The teacher, Gabriela, she doesn't even pay any attention to me because I'm so far behind. How many of you know the battle's begun? And Brenda's in another class, Pastor Scott, and she's learning Spanish. So I'm mad at her. <laughs> You know, I think once you're in the will of God, things are going to be easy. And so I remember after four weeks, I drop out of school. Because if this was easy, why, if this was God's will, why is it so easy, hard? Do you guys understand what I'm talking about? And I remember reading, and I found a book in the, in, the, in the book of Exodus where God told Moses to get, a, you get an interpreter. And I said, that scripture's for me. <laughs> because Moses couldn't speak so good. And how many of you know this Bible's thick? You can usually find something to justify your situation. <laughs> and I, in 30 seconds, I had it all worked out. I'd drop out of language school, and, uh, and, uh, because, and then I'd go get an interpreter and start speaking into, uh, in, 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 all over Costa Rica and Central America, and people would get saved. They'd get filled with the Spirit, and, and, and people's lives would be changed. And i go to Brenda, Brenda, this is what God told me. Has anybody ever heard that? <laughs> I go, Brenda, God told me this. And Brenda goes, Jim, why did God send us here? I hate when she says that kind of stuff. <laughs> and I said to learn Spanish. And so the next day, I got back into language school. And six months later, I was ministering, Por que de tal manera amó Dios al mundo? Que ha dado su hijo para que con el que, que no quiere, mas tenga vida eterna. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I remember we lived six years in Costa Rica. One year alone, I preached 200 times in Spanish, even interpreting. And I said, thank God I'll never have to climb that mountain again. <laughs> and then God sends us to Moscow. <laughs> How many of you have ever heard that Russian is easy to learn? <laughs> Their language... Where's Lori? She's been, she was over there. Oh, you know what their alphabet, their alphabet doesn't even look like ours. And we lived there three years. And we could speak pretty good Russian. And then when we moved to Hungary in 1997, I didn't even know Hungarian was a language. <laughs> but if you will Google the hardest languages in the world for English speakers to learn, it will be Mandarin Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Arabic, and usually Hungarian is either fifth or seventh in the, in the most hardest languages. And so after 20 years, I speak bad Hungarian. <laughs> and my Hungarian is, Scott, as we go to store, bread buy. <laughs> Somebody said, well, you lived there so long. 
Why don't you speak good? I go, well, you're on your fourth language. You can criticize me. <laughs> Amen? I'm talking about having to encouraging yourselves in the Lord. When you take a step of faith, when there's going to be challenges, whatever your daily walk or wherever you work, there's going to be battles. And sometimes you have to encourage yourself. I mean, Pastor Scott's not going to always be around. The home new group's not going to be around. Sometimes the church, I mean, you need to encourage yourself. I like that. He encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. He knew God. A lot of times we know about God, but he knew his God. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? He had to encourage. They were getting ready to stone him. That's discouraging situations. When we lived in Costa Rica for the, those years we lived there, about the first 10 years as missionaries, we didn't live, we existed financially. And uh, somebody said, well, it's pretty cheap to live down there. Well, when you're just living on a couple of hundred bucks a month. And we'd eat beans and rice. And beans and rice. Rosy frijoles. <laughs> and sometimes rice and beans. <laughs> and somebody said, well, I like rice and beans. But every day. <laughs> every day. And uh, I, for those one year, I'm talking about encouraging ourselves in the Lord. We lived on the edge of the jungle. In Costa Rica, when we lived there, it wasn't touristy. And we lived about four kilometers or three miles from the Pacific Ocean. And we had monkeys outside our doors and iguanas in our house. <laughs> I'm talking about big iguanas. <laughs> and we were sleeping under mosquito nets. Felt like real missionaries. <laughs> and I remember we had no money. And uh, we were the only Americans that lived on that whole part of the country. And we'd minister in the jungles and in the mountains of that part of the country, and, and I'd go in as far as I could with my motorcycle, and uh, you could, you'd have to hike in to these churches up in the mountains, and the parking lot, Jeff, would be a bunch of horses, because <laughs> there was no roads, and there'd be eight or ten people there, and, and uh, six months out of the year, it rains every afternoon in Costa Rica, and I remember we were just struggling, and go in there, and I'd walk down these paths through the, the jungle at night back to my motorcycle. It'd be pouring down, raining, and I'd just say, nobody even knows I'm doing this. Nobody knows I'm doing this. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You could be working in the nursery or doing children's church, and you say, nobody even knows I'm doing this. And I remember, you know, I'd get so discouraged sometimes. And we just had no finances, and just, we just had one child at the time. And I remember one afternoon I came home, and, uh, you know, of course, no air conditioning and just anything like that. And, uh, and Brenda said, somebody, this was way before email and cell phones and everything. Did anybody remember those days? <laughs> A few of us. <laughs> How did you live? <laughs> and uh, as people's hands start to shake. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I remember coming home one day, and we had a phone that worked part of the time, and Brenda said, some guy uh, from Ohio called about an hour ago. And his, he said that he needed to talk to you real bad. And we were in this little village in Costa Rica. And uh, he said he was going to, call every 15 minutes until I got home. And uh, so every, Brenda said every 15 minutes the phone has been ringing. And so, and you know, a few minutes after I got home, the phone rings. And this guy from Ohio, this is back in the early, in the 84, 85, the guy from Ohio gets on the phone. He goes, uh, Jim, do you remember me? My name's Chris. I had just met him real briefly one time. And he goes, uh, I said, yeah, I remember you. And he goes, Jim, I want to send you an offering. How many of you know he's got my attention? <laughs> and uh, he goes, where do I send it to? You know, the Lord has been speaking to me. And uh, I give him the address in Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, where our offices are. And I'm, all the time I'm thinking, how much is he going to send? <laughs> Yeah, maybe $100, maybe $200, and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, before the conversation's over and everything, and Chris was crying on the phone, uh, and he, I go, Chris, how much are you sending? 
He goes, Jim, I want to send you and Brenda $10,000. I go, Brenda, this guy sent it $10,000. Nobody knew what I was doing, but God knew what I was doing. Nobody knows where you're at, but God knows where you're at. Your attitude, my attitude, might not always be perfect, but God is a God of grace and a God of mercy. Amen? So if you, sometimes you need to encourage yourself. You're going through a financial situation. Encourage yourself in the Lord. We've uh, lived in Budapest. You put the map of, uh, of all of Eastern Europe on there. Um, Andrew, is that Andrew back there? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, there's Hungary. Go to the next one. Um, uh, it's a, the very next one there. Okay, this is a, we live in Hungary and Budapest, and Scott was there, and Jeff has been there, and uh, Poland. All these countries from Poland. This used to be Czechoslovakia, now it's Czech, Czech Republic and Slovakia and Hungary. This used to be all of Yugoslavia, now it's eight different country, countries. It's Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, and Macedonia, and we minister. We base out of Budapest, and the reason we live in Budapest, Hungary, is within 250 miles of eight different countries. And so for 45, we live in Budapest. We could drive 45 minutes and be in Slovakia. Uh, two hours, we can be in Czech Republic. Well, uh, sometimes an hour and a half, it'll be in Serbia or Croatia, an hour and a half into Romania. And sometimes I'll drive through four different countries in one day. But before 1990, all these countries over here, they used to be behind the Iron Curtain. How many of you remember the Iron Curtain? Where you had to smuggle Bibles into there. And uh, now there's, since the fall of communism, there's probably more freedom to preach the gospel in the countries of Eastern Europe than there is in the United States. Whereas just a few years ago in Hungary, the, the government, which is mostly atheist, but it's not the California kind of atheism. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, we don't mention one nation under God and all that kind of thing. It's just what they were taught under communism. And so, and, uh, but, and but about four years ago, five years ago in Hungary, they passed a law. They required that they want all the middle schools in all of the country, all the public schools, to have religion classes. Not necessarily because they wanted to get Christianity or in there and anything, but they wanted to give the kids morals. How many of you understand when I, we could use some morals in our schools? And so they didn't, Jeff, have people to teach the religion classes. So they asked groups like us in Campus Crusade for Christ and YWAM, we'd go into the schools and start teaching them, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And seeing young people in these schools. How many of you know God can use the unsaved like government sometimes? <laughs> Easier than he can use saved people. <laughs> because we want to spiritualize. But God was on his purpose. And there's grace over that part of the world. But for close to 60 years. Uh, you know, we base in Budapest. And uh, I remember in, we moved there in 1997 with our four children. And uh, um, when we first moved there. I mean, uh, the first few years, uh, uh, we didn't know Hungary was so strategically placed. I mean, it's like Ford's is based out of Budapest, and Google and Microsoft is all based out of Budapest because it's so central to all of Eastern Europe. And, uh, and we didn't know that when we moved there, but it's real easy to get around. And for the first two years we were there, from 97 to 99, I would travel up to different parts, like to Slovakia and Poland and down to Bulgaria. And uh, I'd drive through cities of 50,000 people, and there would be no churches. I'm talking about no Baptist, no Charismatic, no Assembly of God, no Christian, no non-denominational, no church in a town of 50,000 people because of communism. And there might have been buildings, but they were mostly uh, turned into museums or just empty. Because during communism, you were persecuted, or they're put in jail, or you were, couldn't go to university. You were so much stress. And now, and I was driving through these towns, and I still remember this day driving through a town in Slovakia called Banska Bystrica, Slovakia. And I said, I, I'm going to another town in Slovakia, and I asked the pastor of the town, I'm going, how many churches are there in Banska Bystrica? And he said, there's no church in Banska Bystrica. And I said, somebody needs to do something about this. Have you ever heard that, pastor? usually that somebody is you 
because God showed it to you. And usually you can't do it. That's why it's called faith. Remember Jesus told those guys to go into all the world and change the, change the world. They couldn't do it, but they did. And somebody needs to do something about this. And all God wants us to do is say yes. Everybody say yes. yes. When, because the devil will always tell you what you can't do. And I remember in 1999, we changed our whole ministry. And we said we were going to start working. We talked to different pastors in Romania and Bulgaria and found out we could start brand new churches in these towns and cities for $4,000. There's usually believers in those towns, but they're having to travel so far to go to. They want a church. They want their own church. And we found out we could start for a church for $4,000. And I remember back at the beginning of 1999, Scott, we were believing God to start nine churches in 1999. How many of you know it's easy to be excited at the beginning of the vision? <laughs> Isn't that right? Everybody thinking we were so excited and we were going to believe God. Nine churches in 1999. And I remember we were so excited. Brenda, we were changing our whole ministry. I was just going around teaching before. And now we're going to work with pastors, believe God for $4,000 each for each. And we know that doesn't make a church go. It's the anointing and the vision of the pastor. But it's enough to get it off the ground where they rent a building for, on Sunday morning for a few hours. And it usually lasts a one to two years because the pastors work jobs and all that kind of thing. And, and uh, I remember as soon as we made that decision our finances went way down has that ever happened to anybody and after the first month and the second month goes by I remember and I go to everything was just going wrong with our finances and you know nine churches in 1999 was just a distant dream and I go Brenda maybe this wasn't the Lord I said that after two months and once again she goes Jim what do you originally feel like God told us to do once again, I didn't like it. <laughs> and I said, start nine churches in 1999. I got back into faith. How many of you know you can get back into faith? Peter denied Jesus and got back into faith. Some of us need to get back into faith, believe in God for our families to come to the Lord. Some of us need to get back into faith concerning healing. Some of us need to get back into faith concerning finances. I got back into faith. And in 1999, we saw nine new churches started in Eastern Europe. The following year, we saw 13 churches. The following year after that, it was 15 years. Every year since then, since 19, that we've seen between 13 and 17 new churches started in uh, all the way from Poland to, to Bulgaria and Albania. We've seen 307 new churches started in Eastern Europe. Church Alive has supported a bunch of them or sponsored them. And I wish I could tell you all these churches are doing great. I could tell you every one of them's got problems. <laughs> That's not a bad confession. <laughs> they got problems because there's people in them. <laughs> of those 307 churches, about 287 of them are still going on. Have we failed because some have closed? The only time you fail is because when you're not obedient to the Lord. I wish I could tell you there's revival going on in Eastern Europe and Serbia and Macedonia and Bulgaria. There's not revival going on. Otherwise, you wouldn't have towns with no churches. Up. But we're preparing for revival. So when revival comes, there's places to go. And... Um, this year, we're believing God to start another 15 churches. We've got the finances for 11 of them already. Many of them have already started. Working with uh, national pastors in Poland, and, you know, I, I, I speak four languages or three and a half languages, but we work with 13 different languages. In Slovakia, they speak Slovak. In Czech, they speak Czech. Poland, they speak Polish. Bulgaria, they speak Bulgarian. Macedonian, they speak Macedonia. Serbian, they speak... And nobody knows each other's language. <laughs> and so we use interpreters, and they're just so used to it. And uh, we're making an impact. Some of these churches are 25 people. Some of them are 225 people. But when you're the only church in town, they're not worried about what the people down the street are doing. <laughs> And everybody immediately knows you're there. One of the neat things we get to do is um, 
uh, what happened a few years ago. Uh, go to the one where Brenda's ministering. Down here is a country called Albania. Whoop, that uh, looks real big, Brenda. Appreciate that. <laughs> go to the next one. But Albania, uh, uh, go to, uh, Albania is a country in Eastern Europe. It's 76% Muslim. And, uh, but, um, and this guy right here, he was, uh, uh, go to the slide with Brenda speaking in the, the whole church there, uh, there the group there. There's, his name is Hervin. Everybody say Hervin. <laughs> And there's Brenda right there and, uh, in Albania, 76% Muslim. But it's neat how God, Hervey, in 1993, uh, uh, the Soviet Union just fell apart. Albania used to be communism, and Albania uh, was a Muslim country. Uh, a group from the United States went to Tirana, Albania, and did a crusade. And Hervey was a 17-year-old Muslim kid. He went to that crusade, gave his life to the Lord. Went off to Germany, met his wife, uh, Sadika, it's his wife there. She's also Albanian. And in 2001, uh, I did not even know Hervin, but um, uh, he, somebody gave him, his, me, him my name in Hungary and said, this organization in Hungary will make, help you start it. He wants to go back to Albania, this Tirana, capital city of a million people, and start a church there. He calls me up, and everybody in Eastern Europe, nobody calls me Jim. Everybody say Jim. <laughs> in Eastern European language, Jim sounds very Chinese. Jim, 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 you know, that kind of thing. So everybody calls me James over there. And uh, everybody knows James because of James Bond. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, so Hervin calls me up, and he goes, James, uh, my name is Hervin. I'm going to start a church in, in Tirana. Will you help us? How many of you know I didn't have to pray about it? 2000, about the same time, somebody in a small town in Florida, smaller than Cheyenne Wells, calls me up and says, I hear you work in Albania. Our great-grandparents immigrated to the United States from Albania. We want to help start a church in the land of our heritage. That was shortly after we met Hervin. $4,000 they gave. Hervin started that church in 2001. Since that time, Hervin has started nine other churches in Albania, impacting the nations. These are all young, former young Muslim kids giving their lives to the Lord. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. One of the neat things we get to do is, I'll end with this, is um, we work with gypsies. There's six million gypsies in Eastern Europe. And you go to the last slide. And uh, gypsies, most people don't like them. The Hungarians don't like them the slide, because they're the poorest of the poor. They live in their own villages. They speak their own language. And a lot of times, you know, they, they got a totally different culture. They don't integrate. And nobody to mess with them because they've got all kinds of problems. They populate the prisons. I mean, they got their own culture where 13-year-old girls are marrying 39-year-old guys and just babies and just people illiterate. But And nobody wants to mess with them. How many of you know God likes to mess with that? Because we're the same. Even though we might be literate and, and do, do, do everything what we think is right, we're still messed up. Until you get Jesus. And uh, we've happened in the last about 12, 14 years, we've helped start 25 gypsy churches. And these gypsy churches, they're just, I remember when we started a few months ago, or no, about five years ago, in uh, Macedonia. And it was right outside the, the, the capital city. Um, and uh, this pastor calls me up there, and he's... Uh, he was Macedonian, and he goes, James, he goes, we've got a gypsy village of 7,000 people right outside our city, Skopje, the capital of Macedonia. He goes, will you help start a church there? There's no church in the whole town, and once again, I said, of course I'll do it. And I went there for the very first service, Scott. And, uh, you know, if you've never been in a church before, you don't know how to act. And there was no public building like this. It was just shacks. And just barely running water in the village. And so they cleared out a house. And, uh, and about 80 people packed in a little house with benches. And there was the dog on the floor. And, uh, you know, people running everywhere. And just everything. Kids in the back. One kid sniffing glue. Another kid smoking cigarettes. I love that in church. <laughs> Amen. 
<laughs> and uh, just chaos everywhere. And this Macedonian worship team that uh, wanted to reach the gypsies, they started doing the songs. And people, they don't know they're supposed to. I mean, the gypsies love the music, but there's just still chaos running all around. People walking in and out, people looking in the windows, drinking whatever they're drinking and smoking cigarettes and all. But they love the music. And it was just chaos. And after about 15 minutes, the Spirit of the Lord came in. I'd rather have the Spirit of the Lord in chaos all around than everything decently in order and not the Spirit of the Lord. And there was people walking, but you could sense the presence of the God. And I remember we gave an altar call, and most of the people come forward, and they didn't know that they're supposed to be reverent. <laughs> Do you know? Because you've, you've never been in church before. And I remember, so they're just looking at you. And, uh, but I remember when I gave my life to the Lord, I didn't know what the word born again meant. How many of you understand that's Christian talk? And so when the minister in Loveland, Colorado said, Do how many want to get born again? I didn't know what that meant. But he said, does anybody want more of God? And I wanted more of God. And I went forward. I prayed a prayer. Didn't have a clue what I prayed. But God came in my heart. Are you hearing me? That meeting at that gypsy church, that kid in the back, I remember to this day, that gypsy kid, he comes forward to the altar smoking a cigarette. <laughs> and uh, as I'm le we're leading him in a prayer, he's looking up at us. Nobody's closing their eyes. He's smoking a cigarette saying that prayer. I shared this story in a different place in the south of the United States. Well, people should be more reverent than that. What about come as you are, just as I am? Are you guys hearing me? And uh, so there was just chaos. Six months later, I go back to that church. There's still chaos. <laughs> but there's less chaos. Because God wants us more than we want him. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that young kid, he was still smoking. Who cares? He might be a pastor one day. Encouraging ourselves in the Lord. Next year, we're going to believe God for 15 more churches. The year after that, we're going to keep doing that until God tells us different. I have to encourage. My biggest challenge is not traveling around and going to these different countries minister i mean brenda just loves it she our kids love living over there brenda's more of a missionary than me but i my biggest challenge lord you understand is i miss the united states <laughs> do you understand i miss our restaurants <laughs> we live in a city of budapest two and a half million people there's one mexican restaurant <laughs> They call it Mexican. <laughs> but when you got Hungarian goulash on the menu. <laughs> but we're thankful for it. And I just miss the American culture. And I miss, you know, you go to Walmart here in the United States. And if you don't like it, you can take it back three months later. There you got three days. Maybe they'll give you a store credit. And how I have to encourage myself in the Lord is... I miss my American sports. <laughs> I, this is who, I mean, I grew up with a Bronco fan. I remember when Craig Morton was the quarterback. Does anybody remember that? I remember when Floyd Little <laughs> during the 60s. But for years, we'd get one football game, the Super Bowl. And it would come on live at 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> Somebody said, well, Jim, you should be more spiritual than that. I go, you go live over there. <laughs> and Scott, they always say, well, I'm not called. <laughs> it come on at 1.30 in the morning in German. <laughs> and we don't speak German. And, but we'd stay up as a family and just watch it. And we'd listen. Das ist ein Weib receiver. <laughs> Be I East John Elve. <laughs> I'm talking about encouraging yourself in the Lord. Sometimes we need to encourage ourselves. Let's stand. We're making an impact on Eastern Europe. When we moved there in 1997, 
We thought we'd be there in the three years. Now we're starting our 20th year. And uh, I always think of the scripture, man makes his plans, but God guides our steps. I want everybody to close their eyes this morning for just a minute. Father, I pray that you would encourage all of us this morning. Just like David encouraged him to sell himself in the Lord, his God. God, make yourself real to us this morning. Help us to know where you're real in our lives in spite of what's going on around us, whether it be financial, whether it be physical or a health issue or a family issue that looks impossible. Help us to be encouraged in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, Lord. Worship team. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> How many of you guys enjoyed that? Uh, you can be seated for a second. And uh, we're going to prepare the offering for Jim. <clears throat> but I want you guys to pray about a few things that Jim said. One thing I love about Jim Purr, I want you guys to understand something as a pastor, and uh, Jim Brown could probably vouch for this too, is there's a lot of people that always look for places to speak and a lot of people looking for dollars and looking for things. And one thing I love about Jim, and I can tell you this as your pastor, is I protect you guys from people I don't believe are called by God or have wrong motives. Or what I love about Jim is he's straightforward as a, he's a real, real man, right? And that's what we need. And that's what I believe God wants is the reality of, of just like I say all the time, be you, but be you with Jesus. And uh, so I appreciate that. And I want to say this is, is um, when you, I want you guys to begin to change your mind shift of your money. I know it sounds crazy, is, is we're not gunning for money, but how many of you guys realize Jesus, the Bible, the Scriptures, the Word of God? How many of you guys believe the Word of God is real? Cover to cover. You can't take anything out of it. And it actually says in there, your dollars, your coins, your money is your seed. Now imagine if you had a bunch of seed, and you never planted that seed, you'd never have a harvest. you got to think about this, you never would have a harvest. If you just kept that seed and you, and you live with this mindset of, oh, I'm afraid, I don't want to lose the seed, i got to have the seed, and you never plant it, all you're ever going to have is seed. But when you plant the seed, that gives the harvest. But at the same time, how do you guys realize if you don't take your seed and throw it on good ground, if you throw it on a road, you're not going to get any harvest either. And so I believe where you plant your seed determines where your harvest comes from. And I can vouch for that I believe this ministry that you heard about today is good ground. How many of you guys believe where souls are being saved is good ground? Where churches are being built is good ground. And I think 15 churches a year is a great goal. And it's, a, and it's powerful. And, I've, and I had an opportunity a few years ago to go with Jim and see a bunch of his churches where he was showing you in Slovakia, that's where, with the gypsies, that's where we're getting ready to start a school this fall. So Church of Lives over there as well because of that ministry. And that's powerful that you guys are brand, you're part, you got work over there. But I want you guys to pray today because what, I don't want us to get in the habit of, well, I'm just going to reach in when I got it, I got it, I'm going to give. I want you to actually pray about, Lord, for me and my household, what are we to give for this ministry? And know that when you give, because we as a church, corporately, we do support him monthly as a church. And so what he's talking about today, you're part of that. You guys realize that. 300 some churches, you and, you and the seats are part of this. But today I want you to pray and say, for me and my household, what are we to sow as seed for this ministry? Because then at the end of that, God will bless you for your faithfulness. Without faith it's possible to please God. Amen. And it's exciting because Mark Valerie Zekin, who was here not too long ago, he's the one that introduced us to them because we've helped fund and help support him to support gypsy churches. So God is moving, amen? And so today I just want you to pray about it and then we're going to pass the bucket. And, uh, <clears throat> and I just want you to, to give from your heart. Not out of guilt, not out of obligation, not out of burden, but out of your heart. Amen? Father God, I just thank you for... The opportunity to have 
the opportunities that we have to give to your kingdom, to give to your churches, to give to your, to save souls, Lord. And that's what we pray, Lord. We pray right now over Brenda, Jim and Brenda, Lord God, that their, their fruit will keep going of their labors for you. But I also pray, Lord, that they are still not, they're not even at the end of their ministry, they're still at the beginning. And I pray for multiplication in their ministry. I pray for multiplication in their funds. I pray for multiplication in their impact over Europe in Jesus' name. I pray for everybody here that's going to give, that they give faithful and they give out of their hearts. But I also pray, Lord, for that you are faithful in what you say, and your word is truth. Give, and it shall be given to you. Press down, shaken together, and runneth over. In Jesus' name, we just thank you for these things. In your precious name. Go ahead, guys. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. The earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. The earth has no sorrow that So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too. hope for the hopeless and all who are straight come sit at the table come taste the grace rest for the weary and all that endures the earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure so lay down your burden All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home, oh, you're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, and come as you are. Fall in. No sorrow that heaven can heal. The earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. For all who are broken. Let me see you just for one second, a little bit of business, then you guys can go and have a great Sunday. Jim Purr's going to be out here, shake his hand on your way out.
And uh, But I want to show you guys these. These are the backpack carnival. This is sign-up sheets on the table. Some of you guys got names down. Fantastic. Um, but if you uh, walk by, see if you, whether you can help, whether it's set up, tear down, a game, um, whatever. We really need as many hands. Some of you guys realize what we do out in public represents not just the church, but Jesus Christ himself. Right. And you guys can vouch for that because some of you guys have hated church because of the way it was representing Jesus, right? right? So we need to represent well and with excellence. So if you can put your name down, we sure would appreciate it. Vanna White, can you take these out to the table? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then if you didn't get a card, you can get them on the way out, too, for Jim and Brenda Purr. And next weekend, though, is something pretty exciting going on, too, we want to invite you to be a part of. We're still trying to do some outreach over in Kiowa County. And next Saturday is Eads Bash. And uh, it's a great time. It's really actually pretty fun and laid back. But we're actually going to have a booth there um, where we're going to give away helium balloons and some announcements that Church Alive is trying to come that direction and, and uh, minister to that area and that community and some cotton candy we're going to try to give away and do all kinds of stuff. And if you could be a part of it, see that wonderful lady there on your way out and, um, and just see um, how you can be a part and what time frame we're looking at and all that kind of stuff. But it's going to be a great time. And I mean, just getting out and, I mean, here's what you can do is show up to an event like that and just shake hands and love people. It shows Jesus and represents well. Amen. So, God bless you guys. Thanks for coming. Next week, same place. How many of you guys believe pretty soon, if you look around the room, we need an overflow room? Yeah. How many of you guys believe that can happen very soon? Yeah. So, next week, same time, same place. Bring somebody. God bless you.